Welcome back to our IB Biology video series. This is the third video in IB Biology Topic 1, Cell Biology, where we will be looking at membrane structure, particle movement, and vesicle transportation. As covered in our previous video, all cells contain a plasma membrane, which controls what passes in and out of the cell. It is therefore important that you can understand the structure and function of this membrane. Our current understanding of membrane structure is represented by the fluid mosaic model, which has three key components, phospholipids, cholesterol, and proteins. But what are phospholipids? Well, the answer is in the name. They contain both a phosphate region and a lipid region. The phosphate region is negatively charged, meaning it is hydrophilic, i.e. attracted to water. The lipid region is positively charged, meaning it is hydrophobic, i.e. not attracted to water. Since the phospholipid has both a hydrophilic and hydrophobic end, it is a class of molecule known as amphipathic. Cholesterol is a steroid and, like phospholipids, is also amphipathic. Let's have a look at how it all fits together. The phospholipids are arranged into a bilayer with the hydrophobic lipid tails facing inwards and the hydrophilic phosphate heads facing outwards. Cholesterol is found between adjacent phospholipids and it reduces both membrane fluidity and the permeability to hydrophilic particles. Interdispersed between the phospholipids are proteins. These can be integral, passing through either one or both layers, or peripheral, sitting on the outside of the phosphate heads. Some integral proteins act as channels to allow particles to pass in and out, whilst some peripheral proteins form glycoproteins by attaching to carbohydrate chains. However, as you may have guessed, categorizing membrane proteins into simply integral and peripheral is a little crude. In fact, there are six main functions that membrane proteins can carry out. These are best remembered using the mnemonic CC chip. So, cell to cell adhesion, cell to cell communication, channels for passive transport, hormone binding sites, immobilized enzymes, and pumps for active transport. Obviously, this fluid mosaic model wasn't once just dreamt up. There were a series of experiments and scientists who helped determine this structure. The three main pairs of scientists are Gorta and Grendel, Danielli and Davson, and Singer and Nicholson. Gorta and Grendel measured the surface area of some red blood cells' membranes. Then, they extracted the lipid from these cells and re-measured it, finding that it was double. They used this to theorise that the lipid layer was a bi-layer. Danielli and Davson then used electron micrographs to show that there was protein in the membrane. They used this to theorise that this lipid bilayer must have a protein layer outside, covering the surface to hold the lipids in place. Their model was known as the tram track model, for obvious reasons. Finally, Singer and Nicholson used three key developments to complete our understanding. They first used freeze fracture electromicrographs to show the inside of the lipid bilayer had indents and thus protein was found peripherally and integrally. Then, they used NMR to show that the lipids could move and so could not be held in place. They finally used X-ray diffraction to show that lipids gave patterns similar to liquid paraffin, showing that they must have fluid tails. Putting this all together, they theorised that proteins do not form a structural layer and the lipid component is fluid. Furthermore, Proteins are not attached to the outside, 
but embedded within and sometimes passing through. This therefore gave rise to the fluid mosaic model that we know today. We have now covered the structure of the membrane in a good amount of detail, but to understand how this relates to its function, we need to explore particle movement. The four main ways in which particles move are simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. Simple diffusion is the net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration down the concentration gradient. It utilizes existing kinetic energy and so is a passive process. For example, pollen diffusing through the air. It is worth noting that diffusion can occur in free space or across a membrane. Facilitated diffusion is just like simple diffusion, except the particles moving are large or charged, and so they require specific integral proteins. These proteins can either be carriers or channels. Let's look at these. Carriers transport lipid insoluble molecules, for example, glucose passing into a red blood cell. Channels transport small polar molecules and ions, for example, sodium ions entering nerve cells. This movement of sodium into nerves is explored in greater depth in the latter topics of IB biology. Osmosis is the net movement of water molecules from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration across a partially permeable cell membrane. It too uses existing kinetic energy, and so is a passive process. For example, water moving into a potato. Active transport is the net movement of particles from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration against the concentration gradient. It uses energy from ATP and carriers in the membrane, and so is an active process. For example, the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. Unlike the other processes, you can be asked to describe the mechanics of active transport at the membrane. So let's take a second look at this example. Three sodium ions enter the pump and ATP phosphorylates the pump, causing a change in configuration. This allows the sodium to exit the pump and so exit the cell. Now, potassium molecules can enter the pump and the remaining phosphate groups detach, causing a reset in configuration. This allows the potassium to exit the pump and so enter the cell. You can obviously use any example of active transport, but we find this is a good example as it comes up later in the syllabus. The IB also expects you to be able to understand the medical applications of osmosis, and there are a few terms that arise in this context that you should be able to define. The first is osmolarity, which is a measure of the solute concentration in a solution. A solution that has the same osmolarity as another is known as isotonic. A solution that has a higher osmolarity than another is known as hypertonic. Finally, a solution that has a lower osmolarity than another is known as hypotonic. But why is this relevant? Well, when red blood cells are placed in a hypertonic solution, water will move out by osmosis, causing them to wrinkle. When placed in a hypotonic solution, water will move into them. However, as they do not have a cell wall, they build up too much pressure and burst. As you can imagine, this isn't good, and hence why in medical procedures, red blood cells are soaked in isotonic solutions to prevent either of these two situations. As we discussed, particles can move by diffusion, osmosis, or active transport. But what if you want to move large items, or items in bulk? Well, 
This is where vesicles play a key role. Vesicles are simply spherical arrangements of phospholipid bilayer, like a capsule, that can form thanks to the fluidity of the membrane. Vesicles are involved in two forms of active transport, called exocytosis and endocytosis. Exocytosis transports large materials, or materials in bulk, out of the cell. Endocytosis transports large materials, or materials in bulk, into the cell. But what actually happens during these processes? Well, during exocytosis, the materials to exit the cell are packaged by the Golgi into vesicles, which reach the plasma membrane. Here, they fuse with the plasma membrane, and the contents are released. The membrane then flattens afterwards. During endocytosis, the materials to enter the cell come in proximity to the plasma membrane, which is then pinched inwards to form a vesicle. This then moves through the cytoplasm to where the contents are needed. And that's it. You now know how all different types of substances move both outside and inside cells, and across the plasma membrane. We hope you enjoyed the third video in our IB Biology Topic 1 video series. Check out our notes, flashcards and questions on our website to reinforce your understanding from this video.